Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we'll discuss buttons in menswear, the different garments to feature them, the materials used to make them, and the various ways that they can impact your outfits. <laughs> When it comes to the small details of classic men's style, it's probably a small handful of men who are giving any kind of consideration to buttons in their outfits, save perhaps for those who are wondering which ones to close on a jacket. However, like the knobs on a kitchen cabinet, buttons are a small finishing detail that can in fact have a big impact on the outfit. As one example to lead us off today, just adding buttons to a collar of a shirt, thereby making it a button-down collar, instantly has an impact on the formality of the shirt. Which is to say, if a collar has buttons, it's much less formal. On that note, you can find our guide to different shirt collars in menswear here. But before we get into too many specifics right off the bat, let's back up a little bit and discuss the broader ways in which buttons can impact your outfits. We'll start today with quantity. In other words, the first way that buttons can impact your outfit is just through their sheer number. The example we already gave of having a button-down collar immediately makes a shirt and therefore an outfit less formal, although it does also place it firmly within the realm of American Ivy style. And in a similar fashion, a tailored jacket featuring just one button will have a vastly different look to a two-button, three-button, or three-roll-two jacket style. This is because the location of the buttoning point on a jacket impacts the length of the lapels and the V-shape that's created on the chest. No, I don't want to turn on power-saving mode. We're in an energy crisis now, and will be for some time to come. All we can do is face it recognize it, and meet the challenges it poses. And this effect on the change in appearance is perhaps even more obvious with double-breasted jackets and overcoats, which come in various permutations of six buttons with two functional, or six on two, four buttons with two functional, or four on two, six on three, four on one, and various other configurations. Perhaps a less obvious place where buttons can also come into play is on dress trousers, where various quantities can be used to close the waistband and or the fly, and also to affix suspenders or braces. You may occasionally see buttons on the rear pockets of trousers, although these are mostly an ornamental or decorative detail, and don't serve much of a functional purpose other than maybe giving just a bit more security to the placement of your wallet. And aside from shirts, jackets, overcoats, and trousers, buttons can also appear on other types of menswear garments as well. Waistcoats, of course, would be another prime example, and indeed they have their own buttoning rules, and you can also see them on garments like gloves and traditional button boots. If you'd like to learn more about this more historic type of footwear, which is now largely confined to formal daywear, you can find our article on button boots here, and be sure to check out our selection of gloves in the Fort Belvedere shop. But mentioning buttoning rules for things like jackets, waistcoats, and the like brings us to our next main point of how buttons can impact an outfit, which is whether they're fastened or not. In general, leaving things unbuttoned will always show an air of nonchalance and casualness, sometimes in the realm of Italian sprezzatura. Meanwhile, keeping things buttoned up will generally be seen as more formal. This is evidenced by the fact that buttoned up has entered greater language just to mean something that's more reserved. Not following the traditional buttoning rules for things like suit jackets, then, flouts the rules and communicates an air of nonchalance. The same idea would apply if you have working buttons on the sleeves of your jackets, also called surgeon's cuffs, where leaving some of those buttons unbuttoned also presents a relaxed attitude. Something is just idling out there. 
Other examples would include leaving more buttons unbuttoned on your shirt placket, or not fastening the buttons on a button-down shirt collar. Just be sure to assess the relative formality of the environment in which you're going to find yourself, and adjusting these details accordingly. And whatever the case may be for any of the previous examples, we wouldn't recommend leaving a button fly open for all to see. That takes care of the points about quantity and fastened versus unfastened, so let's move on to our next point, color and contrast. When you buy a dress shirt, most of the time the buttons are going to be in an innocuous and almost unnoticeable off-white color. For especially dark shirts, you might see dark buttons for the same reason. However, as you might expect, if you get a shirt with strongly contrasting buttons to the fabric of the shirt itself, this will obviously make things stand out more. Examples would include things like bright white buttons on a navy shirt, or black buttons on a white shirt. But be aware that as soon as a shirt has strongly contrasting buttons, it immediately becomes more informal. Think, for example, of the proper environment being drinks after work, rather than the office itself. The same effect can be had with sport coats as well, with the contrast more suitable for fun summer jackets in fabrics like wool hopsacks or linens, since these evoke a Neapolitan vibe that's more suited for hot and sunny weather. Mmm, yeah, maybe they've got some sort of piece of equipment running. They were here when I got here, so... Property owners must be vigorously encouraged to fix up. The prime example for contrasting buttons on jackets, though, is probably the navy blazer, which has a wider, almost year-round use. In fact, contrasting buttons in mother-of-pearl or metal, like brass, silver, or pewter, are actually one of the distinguishing characteristics that determine what a blazer is. The term blazer is meant to encapsulate the boldness of the garment, and these buttons, which can often be further embellished with things like anchor designs or other motifs, speak to that boldness. By the way, for a comprehensive guide to the differences between blazers, sport coats, and suit jackets, you can go here. Most of the time, with suit jackets and sport coats, your buttons aren't going to be exactly the same color as the fabric, but they're also not going to be strongly contrasting. You might see black buttons on a charcoal gray suit, or dark brown buttons on a navy suit, for instance. But even though these colors are similar, dark, and subdued, that doesn't mean that you should pass up the opportunity to use them for further points of harmony in your ensemble. For example, if you do have brown buttons on a navy jacket, you could wear a pair of brown trousers that would harmonize with those buttons and make them stand out a bit more. In other words, don't overlook the possibilities for coordination that buttons can provide in your outfits. We've got one more consideration to cover here before we go over the various individual types of buttons you're likely to see on your garments, and that's how they're stitched on. Oh, I think it stopped, whenever it was. You can see how quiet helps us, can't you? If buttons hardly get any consideration from the average man, the ways in which they're stitched onto garments receive even less attention. That is, except for from the true connoisseurs of menswear. The standard stitch for holding a button onto a garment, of course, is an X across the four holes, but other styles do exist and can add more character. Options would include vertical or horizontal parallel stitches, a square stitch, a zigzag stitch, or a three-sided stitch, among others. The most famous of these alternative stitch styles, though, is probably the Zampa di Galina, or chicken's foot stitch, supposedly created by the grandmother of Neapolitan shirtmaker Luigi Borelli as a method of avoiding sewing errors when she started losing her eyesight in advanced age. Whether this particular legend is true or not, the Zampa di Galina stitch has become a hallmark of craftsmanlike quality. Because, like the Milanese buttonhole, stitching buttons on with this technique has to be done by hand. 
Perhaps the slant of the chicken's foot stitch presents a similarly asymmetrical appeal to something like a four-in-hand tie knot, or perhaps it provides just a bit of subtle movement to the buttons themselves. Whatever the case may be, it's a stitch that's prized by the menswear aficionado. More loud engines this time of day than I think we're used to. <laughs> Seems like we can't escape them no matter what time we film. It's a pleasant afternoon in June. Mel and his best girl, Farah, are enjoying a ride. Well, he's enjoying it. She's not too happy about the way he drives. He's got a good car, and he likes to show what it can do. And, of course, all of these examples are considering buttons that have four holes, though other types do obviously exist. So, for more information about button stitching and button types, you can consult our video on how to sew on a button here. Speaking of how buttons are constructed, though, that brings us to our final section today, the different materials used to make buttons. If you call attention to your buttons as a style feature, the quality of their make matters. Cheap buttons are often going to be made from low-quality plastics that will crack or perhaps even melt in the dryer. Even if the low quality of such cheap buttons isn't apparently visible, it's definitely not going to do you any favors to enhance your style. Indeed, one of the many fun decisions about getting bespoke garments made is that you can choose the button style and material. As you might expect, then, in the broad strokes, quality clothing comes with quality buttons made in natural materials. The added labor and cost involved make them more desirable, but their natural appearance is the true selling point in most cases. On that note, we'll start our breakdown with buttons made from brass and other metals. As we noted earlier, a common feature of many blazers is their use of metallic buttons. Most traditionally, these are made from brass, but they can also be made from other types of metal. This is largely to do with the blazer's design being influenced to a certain degree by military attire, and for more information on the origins of the blazer, you can take a look at our comprehensive blazer guide here. We also gave a brief mention earlier to Mother of Pearl Buttons, also known as Nacre, which are punched from the insides of marine shells. Originally, these were produced on a grand scale in the U.S. state of Iowa using freshwater mollusks from the Mississippi River, though today most of the global production comes from farms in Asia. By the way, you can test for true mother of pearl by holding the button up to your tongue, lips, or cheek. If it is authentic, the button will feel cool. You can also test by tapping the button against your front teeth, as plastic produces a duller and lower sound than shell does. Mother of Pearl buttons are a common choice for shirts because of their white or off-white color, which complement all but the darkest of shirt colors. And of course, since very dark shirts aren't really commonly seen in classic menswear, Mother of Pearl has a prominent place. One thing you may notice when buying dress shirts with mother-of-pearl buttons is that the thickness of the buttons can vary more between shirt makers than those of plastic buttons usually do. For example, it's a trend among southern Italian shirt makers to use mother-of-pearl buttons that are particularly thick, and while they do look impressive, they can be a bit more irritating and difficult to fit through shirt buttonholes, whereas thinner buttons are easier. And some shirt buttons are made with trochus shells instead of mother of pearl. These are sea snails instead of freshwater creatures, and as a result, the buttons are more yellow and less iridescent, which some people say makes them look a bit more like regular plastic. They're also a bit less durable than mother of pearl buttons, so as a result, they're a bit less desirable, though certainly more so than standard plastic. Another common button material is horn, which is most commonly used for buttons on jackets and trousers. 
These buttons are made primarily from the horns and hooves of cows or water buffalo and are predominantly brown. However, their selling point is the variety of tones they can contain, including swirls and mottling in different colors, ranging from nearly black to reddish brown to beige. These neutral tones pair well with many other colors in menswear, and the distinctiveness from the swirls gives them their own unique charm. A lesser known choice in the button world is Corozo, which is made from the Tagwa nut, in turn from the tree known commonly as the Ivory Palm, which is native to South America's tropical rainforests. These nuts were originally used as disposable ballast in the holds of ships during transatlantic journeys from South America to Europe during the 19th century until their ivory-like appearance was noticed and they became desirable for carving and eventually for making buttons. The interior of the tagua nut naturally has a white color, leading to its other name of vegetable ivory, but Corozo can also be dyed a wide variety of other colors. Casual tweed jackets, as well as some camel hair models like the one I'm wearing here today, sometimes feature leather buttons, which can also be called football buttons since they vaguely resemble the shape of footballs made from leather. There are also imitation leather buttons that are made from plastic, however, so be sure to take a close look to see if they are in fact genuine. And with all of these more distinctive styles out of the way, let's now touch on that most ubiquitous of choices, plastic buttons. In the early 20th century, up until around the 1930s or so, plastic buttons were actually seen as a novelty, and for that reason they could sometimes make their way onto bespoke garments. For instance, you can see here a beautiful set of black cuff buttons with a raised edge that are textured so that they reflect the light differently than the center. Did we lose a piece there? Watch, we're gonna get like another minute into this and then this entire assembly is just gonna fall apart. <laughs> we have a right to be proud of our performance as builders and makers of goods. For instance, this vintage jacket has a beautiful set of cuff buttons that have a raised and textured edge different from the center of the button so that light is reflected differently, thus creating an element of visual interest in a very subtle way. These days, though, production of plastic buttons is cheap to the point of ubiquity, and they can sometimes be bold and fashion-forward in their color or design. And while we have bad-mouthed plastic buttons to a certain extent in today's video, not all plastic buttons are universally of poor quality. Reputable shirt makers, from Charles Tirrett to Brooks Brothers, for instance, use plastic buttons on most of their ranges, though this is a plastic of a more durable quality, so you needn't worry about frequent breakages. Even so, seeking out buttons made from materials other than plastic can be a good shorthand for the quality of a garment. So, although they are exceedingly common and fundamentally practical, buttons can have a significant impact on the look of your outfits. Simple features like quantity, color, material, and stitching can all add up to have different effects, so it's best to have a variety of button styles in your garments and in your wardrobe to get as many different kinds of looks and combinations as possible. In today's video, I'm wearing an outfit that doesn't feature too many different kinds of buttons, although those buttons that are featured are somewhat distinctive. These would be the football buttons on my vintage camel hair sport coat. As the jacket is vintage, these buttons are definitely showing some wear, and we'll leave it up to you viewers to see if you can determine whether they're authentic or imitation leather. The other buttons featured would be those on my shirt's placket, although of course you can't see them under my two-tone knit tie from Fort Belvedere, and these are plastic, though again of a more durable quality. Also partially hidden, in this case by the jacket, would be the buttons on the back pockets of my plain charcoal trousers. I've worn these trousers to ground the outfit against the slightly bolder camel hair jacket, and also to harmonize with the white and gray striped pattern in my shirt. 
Rather than having button cuffs, my shirt today features French cuffs, into which I've got our gold-plated sterling silver eagle claw cufflinks, which feature tiger's eye as the stone to again harmonize in color feel with the jacket. Other accessories include a wool pocket square in multicolored threads that contribute to a brown color feel overall, an Edelweiss boutonniere from Fort Belvedere, and two-tone shadow-striped socks, also from Fort Belvedere, in charcoal gray and orange to contribute to the gray and brown color feel. Rounding out my outfit today are a pair of gray suede derby shoes from Heinrich Dinkellocker that harmonize well with the trousers and serve to break the overall outfit in two. You can find the socks, boutonniere, tie, and cufflinks I'm wearing in today's video in the Fort Belvedere shop, along with a wide variety of other menswear accessories. 